Welcome, Econ 104. Today we're going to be taking a look at national output, GDP, and our circular flow. So that is to be specific, our goals for today. So the first goal is that we want to understand what exactly GDP is and how we're going to calculate it. And we're going to be taking a look at a few different ways to calculate it as well. Beyond that, what we really want to nail down is our circular flow diagram. That is our understanding as to how money flows through our economy from our households to our firms, back to our households, complicated a little bit. We'll throw in financial markets, international markets, governments, etc. So that being said, let's start off and let's start off by taking a look at a simple economy and with this simple economy, an understanding of what GDP is and some different ways in which we can measure it. So let's jump over and take a look at that. So to start off, GDP. Well, GDP, what this stands for is our gross domestic product. And what GDP is looking to measure is it's looking to measure the value of all final domestic goods and services produced within a year. So let's say all final goods, uh, one more O in there, goods and services. And I said it within a year, but really this is going to be in a period of time. So I'm just going to say in a period. Maybe we might be interested in the GDP of a quarter, of a half year, of a month, something like that. Uh, typically, when GDP is reported, it is annual GDP, but we could just say over the course of a period of time. Now, big part there is this is going to be all new final goods and services produced, right? It's new stuff. It's not stuff being resold. So, and all final. So, not our intermediate steps, our iron that is then being used to produce a um pipes for other situations or iron being used to build skyscrapers or you being used to build vehicles etc no it's all final goods and services so that final good that's produced based off of all of our intermediate goods to take a look at what this gdp is this idea of gdp let's start off by taking a look at a, just a simple economy and let's take a look at a very simple economy where we just have two different farmers so we have two different farmers or two different orchardists, one of which grows apples. The other one, the other one grows oranges. So we have our two far farmers, one growing apples, one growing oranges, and we want to figure out, hey, in this economy altogether, what is the total value of their production? That is, what is their GDP, their gross domestic product? Well. Let's suppose, as we go through this, that we have our quantity produced, and maybe this is quantity in pounds, or, you know, in most of the other world, if we weren't in uh, the U.S., we could say quantity in kilograms. Maybe let's keep it as kilograms, being a little bit more respectful in that case there. And, okay, so apples, let's say that our apple farmer was able to produce 100 kilograms of apples during our period of time that we're interested in, while our orange orchardist, our orange orchardist was able to make 125 kilograms of oranges. Okay, question is, what we want to figure out is how much was able to be produced in this period of time in this economy. Well, okay, one way we could do it is we could just say, hey, both of these are measured in kilograms. We have 225 kilograms of things produced, right? All we did is we just added that up and we said, hey, we've produced 225 kilograms of stuff. Now, okay, that's not really a great way to measure output because are apples and oranges the same thing, right? Is it really fair to say that, hey, a kilogram of apples is the same thing as a kilogram of oranges. What if we were measuring instead the production of anvils and pillows, 
right? And maybe we were able to make something like a thousand kilograms worth of worth of lead anvils, but only two kilograms worth of pillows. Well, does that mean that we weren't able to produce very many pillows or is it that pillows are very light and fluffy, right? So this whole idea of just measuring the quantity on its own, it's imperfect, right? And really that's what we want to know. We want to know how much stuff we produced. That's the idea behind GDP. How much stuff did we produce within a period of time? But just measuring quantity on its own is not sufficient. So what we need to do then is what we need to do is we need to, instead of figuring out just the quantity produced, we have to figure out the value of the quantity produced. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna introduce the price. And what we're gonna presume is that apples, let's suppose that they go for two, and we'll say these are dollars, so $2 per kilogram. Well, oranges, we'll presume that oranges are going for $1 per kilogram. In this sense here, we can work out our total value from our apples. 100 times 2 is going to be 200. 125 times 1 is 125. And we get altogether $325 worth of stuff being produced within our simple economy. And if we want to think about it in this kind of way, if both the apple orchardist and the orange orchardist were able to sell all of their good to someone in this, so that is they were able to sell all their product, that is everything they were able to produce, they were able to sell. Well, we could take a look at this and we could say within this economy, the amount expended The amount we expended on apples was $200. The amount we expended on oranges was $125. That is, we could say that our total expenditure was $325, right? And in this case here, our total expenditure was the amount we expended on our apples and our oranges. Very similarly, we could take a look at it from the other side and we could say, hey, if the apple orchardist, if altogether everybody in this economy expended $200 on apples, well, hey, if they expended $200 on apples, this is going to be the income of the apple orchardist as well. Everybody expended $200 on apples. The apple orchardist made $200 worth of income. Similarly, the orange orchardist, well, everybody expended $125 on oranges. That is the orange orchardist's income as well. So on the one hand, this measure of total output, total value of output is our, well, total value of output. It's also our total expenditure. It is also finally the total income which our producers have received, right? It's the total income generated within this economy as well. So in this sense here, what we've really taken a look at is GDP, this measure of our total value of all final goods and services produced in a period. And we've seen that really this is synonymous then with our total expenditure in the economy within a period of time. And it is also going to be synonymous with our total income earned. And that all of these terms will be synonymous in this sense. They will all give us, well, truthfully, they will all give us statistically the same answer. That is, as we measure them, there are slight differences. And we'll talk about why that is as we carry on. But ultimately, the value of everything we produce within, a same, within some period of time is going to be equal to the total amount we expend on goods and services. And if that's the total amount we expend, it has to be, again, the total amount of income generated. So, okay. We saw this in our very simple economy with just two producers, apples and oranges, unrelated industries. What happens then if we end up having a layered economy? That is, what happens if we have an economy with a, we'll say a primary, secondary, and tertiary 
industry. And what I mean by this is that we have a primary industry that kind of harvests the raw resource. We have the secondary industry that transforms that raw resource. And then we have our tertiary industry, which makes that final adjustment to it and sells it to the consumer as the final good. And for an example of this, let's take a look at a situation where we have a farmer and we'll presume this is like a wheat farmer. We have a miller. So the miller buys the grain, buys the wheat from the farmer, and mills it into flour. We then finally have the baker who takes all the flour and uh, many other resources as well and makes cookies, muffins, all of the delicious baked goods that we get to enjoy. Well, in this case, we have a problem, right? If we just worked out quantity price or the value as to what was created throughout the whole process, we'd be double counting because, well, in the miller's process of creating, we incorporated the farmer. In the baker's process of creating, we incorporate the miller and the farmer. That is the wheat grown by the farmer. Well, that's not a final good or service. The flour created by the miller. That's not a final good or service. So to prevent this double counting of industries as we go through, what we need to take a look at is a way that we can calculate GDP by looking at the value added as we move from one industry to another. So let's take a look at this value added way of calculating our GDP. So in order to do so, let's kind of create a bit of a table here. We have our three industries, the farmers, the millers, and the bakers. So we can say this is our industry or job perhaps. Let's say that we have our costs. So our costs of production, and this will be in dollars. And then we have our sale price. All right, this is the price that we end up selling our good from are selling our good from, selling our good for. So for example, let's say that the farmer utilizes, ah, uh, let's say the farmer utilizes something like $50 worth of resources in order to be able to plant the seeds, harvest the seeds. I guess you don't harvest the seeds, you harvest the wheat and get it all finalized. And then once it's all put together, they sell all their wheat that they produce for $80. Okay, so a farmer incurs costs of 50, is able to sell for 80. Presuming this is the entire industry, there's no other inputs into the miller's process, right? Grand assumption, but a simplifying assumption in this case. The miller's costs then are, we can switch colors, kind of make this clear. The miller's costs then are 80, right? They buy this flour, or they buy this wheat rather, from the farmer for 80. That is their cost. They then convert this raw wheat into flour. And let's suppose that they can sell this raw wheat for, sorry, they're not selling raw wheat. They're buying raw wheat. They're transitioning this raw wheat into flour. They're selling that flour for 100. The baker then finally, the baker needs to buy that flour for 100. They utilize that flour, they transform it into all of our delicious baked goods. They are then able to sell their flour for, and again, I just did the same thing. They're not selling their flour, they're selling their baked goods for $150. So here we have our tertiary industry altogether, our baker, our final goods and services, our cookies, our baked goods, etc being sold finally for 150 in the end. If we went through, like we did in our previous example with apples and oranges, and we just said, hey, income of the farmer plus income of the miller plus income of the baker, or total expenditure expended on wheat, expended on flour, expended on baking, and worked out, okay, added all this up. So 150, 100, that's 250. 330. If we went and added up all of those sale prices and said, hey, we have a GDP of $330, well, it turns out we'd actually be overestimating. 
drastically overestimating. And the reason behind that is that we are counting, well, this was a lot of this. This was a lot of this, right? We had these previous industries actually already included in the bakers, in the baker's sale of final goods and services. So what we can do is we can adjust this a little bit and we can take a look at the value added to the production process in each step. Because keep in mind, right, the farmer actually added value by putting the seeds in the ground, by harvesting the wheat. The miller added value by taking that raw wheat and milling it, transitioning it from wheat into flour. The baker added value by using his or her labor and converting it into baked goods. So in that sense here, what we want to take a look at is our value value added. And what our value added is, is the price that we were able to sell it for minus our costs of production. And really, these costs, these are non-labor costs. Right? These are the non-labor costs. These were the costs of our raw materials, our capital, everything else that went into this production process. So in this case here, as you work through it, 50 to 80, well, the farmer added $30 of value to this production process. The miller, 80 to 100, well, the miller was able to add $20 of value to this production process. And finally, the baker, the baker was able to add 50 to this production process. Altogether then, what is our total value added? What is the value of our final production if this was our three industries within this country? Well, our GDP in this case here could be measured as $100, right? Just adding up all of the value of each industries and we get $100 worth of value being added through this production process. And in this way here, we're not double counting, right? We're not taking, hey, in this baker's price, we already have incorporated the costs of flour. We already have incorporated the costs of wheat. We already have incorporated the costs of whatever raw resources the farmer needed in order to get the wheat harvested. So by adding value added, we just get the true value created, the true final value of our output within our region, within our economy. The other way that you might be able to notice with this is that our total value added, right? So this is our final value of goods produced. That is our GDP. What you might notice in this is that this total value of GDP is our final good produced by the baker minus the initial costs of production in the primary industry. That is 150 was the value of our final good produced and sold, the baked goods, right? That was our final good. It was consumed at that point. We didn't take our cookies and add something to them and sell them again. Nope, we just bought them and consumed them. Final good. We paid 150 altogether for that. 150 minus our primary industry costs will always yield for us our final value through our value added method as well. So if we're ever trying to calculate GDP through this method, always another way that we can kind of double check. Okay, this is, this is a nice way to take a look at GDP in this very simple way. Even in this example, we saw that in reality, uh, there's many other industries that all interline into each other. For example, yes, we have the farmer for wheat, that then has the miller. But then from the miller to the baker, well, okay, the miller sold flour to the baker. But there's going to be some other farmer that's selling eggs to the baker. There's going to be some other farmer that's selling chocolate, that's selling sugar, that's selling butter, that's sell milk, right? There's going to be a lot more interconnection with this. So again, this is just a simplified version of our economy, just kind of a way that we can visualize how this value added process works in a very simplistic fashion. Okay, so, so far we've taken a look at two different ways to measure or to think about GDP. 
Ultimately, in GDP, we're just thinking about the final value of all goods and services produced within a given period for an economy. We take a look at our simple case of two completely unrelated industries, and we said, hey, the total amount produced by this industry, the total amount produced by that industry, that's our total income, that's our total expenditure, that's our total value of goods produced. We then took a look at this case where we have layered industries, primary, secondary, tertiary, we could even have more going on here, in which case we need to figure out the value added at each step of our production process along the way. What we want to take a look at next is our whole economy, right? Kind of move away from these simplified versions of our economy to our full economy on whole, such as if we were looking at Canada or the US or country in the Eurozone or hey, the Eurozone itself, even looking at somewhere more like China, Korea, India, anywhere in the world, any modern economy, the way that we could measure the total value of goods produced. So let's jump over to the next one here. Let's take a look at really our full circular flow diagram to really get an appreciation as to how money and value and goods and services flow through the economy. I do want to warn you though, before we jump screens, the next screen does have a lot of white on it. It's a big white background, meaning that, hey, if your eyes have become accustomed to this black screen, it might be a bit of a shock. So again, just that heads up as we jump. Here we go. Okay, so we're looking at the flow of money in an economy. And we've already taken a look at a very simple circular flow diagram already, where we took a look at just strictly, let's get my little laser pointer tool going on here. We took a look at just strictly households, firms, and financial markets in order to demonstrate with our supply and our demand that we have our factor markets. So here we referred to them as labor markets last time. Here I want to refer to them as factor markets. And that is because truthfully, this is for our factors of production. Of our factors of production though, labor is going to be our main focus. We also have our financial markets, as we've discussed previously, and we'll get back to taking a look at our financial markets shortly in a few chapters, and our goods and services markets. So our three primary markets that we end up looking at, and really, right, to keep in mind, the field of micro, it would be taking a look at one of these specific markets in detail, right? Any one of these on their own in detail would be the realm of micro. The realm of macro is taking a look at all of these markets in conjunction, in like taking a look at the flow of money around the economy, how the money moves from one market to another, all the way through to affect it all. That is a look at macroeconomics. So, okay, a lot going on here, a lot of arrows happening. Let's discuss this diagram. Let's see what's happening. <clears throat> Let's start off by taking a look at right at the top with our households. So our households, they sell their labor and they end up earning wage, profit, rent, and interest, right? So interest, this comes from their savings. Rent, this is what they get from selling their capital or lending, renting out their capital if they own any. Profit, if they are a firm holder or a shareholder, and wages from the selling of their labor. So ultimately, this is all of the income that comes into households within a nation. Of all of this money that comes in, well, right away, the government takes some of this, right? We have our taxes that get taken off. So taxes get subtracted, and after taxes are subtracted, we're left with our disposable income. That is our income after tax. Taking a look at our income after tax, we have two options as to what we can do with that. We can either consume our income or we can save our income, right? And this is, I really want to be clear. We have this whole idea, we have this whole mentality as we talk about it that, hey, I'm consuming so much and then I have a bunch of extra, I'm going to invest my extra income. What should I invest it in? No, 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 no. That's not the terminology we use in macroeconomics. In macro, in fact, in most of economics altogether, households save. Households do not invest. Uh, we'll get to that in a second, but investment is more the purchase of new capital, new machinery, factories, etc., in order to increase your productive capabilities. Savings is what you do when you put your money aside in order for it to grow. 
So households save. That's a bit different than the terminology we use day to day, but an important terminology difference in order to keep in mind. So you have your disposable income, that is your income after tax. You can either save it in the financial markets and earn some interest, or you can consume it in the goods and services market, the stuff you buy. So from here, all of your consumption, all your consumption in the goods and services market, then ultimately flows to firms. They then, right, you buy a bunch of cheeseburgers. The store you bought those cheeseburgers from gets that money. From that money, the firm then takes all that. They have to redeem some of that money given to the government in indirect taxes. That's our value-added taxes. These are things like GST. They also have to deal with some of their depreciation. So they replenish their depreciated capital through this goods and services market. And then they pay out wages, profit, rent, and interest through the factors market back to the households. So we see that first kind of primary flow of consumption to the firms back through to the households ultimately. What else do we have going on? Well, let's take a look at our government player. So we see that government... They collect taxes, so they collect taxes directly from the households. They also collect our indirect taxes and other taxes from firms. So this is the revenue from the government. They then ultimately will either save some of that, that is they will put that aside, maybe pay off debt or maybe put it aside for later, or the government will engage in their own government purchases, and that is their own purchases of goods and services. From there, the government purchases, again, will flow through to the firms that they purchase from, which then correspond to wages, profit, rent, interest, some depreciation, some taxes on that, and then back through again. So government spending in that case there. What we also have then is from our firms themselves, we have the firms will engage in investment. That is, right, again, to keep in mind that difference, investment and here we'll take a look at the gross investment, which is net investment plus our depreciation. This here is our purchase of new vehicles for our production process, right? If I can buy a new truck in order to start a painting business, well, that truck isn't just for my consumption of the vehicle. That is an investment to allow me to be more productive and allow me to be part to start this painting business. So investment is that purchase of productive capital machinery, equipment, tools, that kind of thing, that is our investment in capital. So they'll buy that capital from the goods and services market, which truthfully is then just from other firms that are making it, right? This here, this investment, this can often be financed. This can be financed through financial markets, through borrowing, right? So in this case here, firms can borrow that borrowed money, is then invested purchasing those capital goods. Now you'll see right now, I primarily have these arrows flowing from the household to the financial market. That is households are savers, firms are borrowers. This of course can go the other way. Firms, or sorry, households could be dissavers. That is, they could be borrowing. Government, instead of having public savings, they could have public borrowing. And firms, firms could be running a cash surplus and they could actually be throwing money into the financial market instead. So that is, that could go the other direction as well. Okay, so we've taken a look at our main players. We've taken a look at households. We've taken a look at governments. We've taken a look at firms. What we also have out here is our world on whole. That is our international scene. We see that with our international scene, that from other countries out in the world, they will buy our goods and services. That is, we will export goods and services to the world. We will sell our stuff made domestically out to the world. Keep in mind what we're looking at is we're looking at the flow of money. So as we export, as we sell our goods and services, we are receiving money from the world. On the flip side of that, we can also buy things from the world. We can buy things that are made abroad and import them into Canada. As we import goods and services, well, our money flows out. 
But we'll see in this as we explore international trade and international economics farther and financial markets is that what we'll witness is that we always need to have a balance between our exports and our imports and the inflows and outflows of capital. And like I said, we'll talk about that in a lot more detail in the coming chapters. Right now, the big idea of this circular flow diagram is just to witness how this whole economy is interconnected and how we can measure the total value of output, the total amount produced, by looking at it through these different lenses. So that being said, circular flow diagram, nice way to look at the economy on whole, to look at the flow of money. Do you need to memorize this? By no means. By no means does this need to be a memorization. This is just a tool that we can utilize, a tool we can look back at to witness how goods and services and how money flows through our economy on whole. That being said, what I do want to focus on next is this distinction between GDP expenditure and GDP income. That is, these are two different ways that we can measure GDP. And what you can witness with kind of our circular flow diagram here is that if we cut our diagram in half from our households down to our firms here, more or less the income side is everything on our left, everything coming out of the firms towards the household, where our expenditure side is more or less everything on the right, everything coming out of our households towards our firms. Now, keep in mind, I say more and less, there are the few exceptions going on there, but generally speaking, expenditure was household to firm, income was looking at firm to household. And because this whole thing is a big circle, a big circular flow diagram, well, GDP measured through that expenditure approach must then be equal to GDP through our income approach. So let's jump over. Let's take a look at how exactly we can measure GDP through these two different approaches. So let's start off by taking a look at GDP through our income approach. And GDP through our income approach, really what we're taking a look at here is just the summation of a few different parts. We want to take a look at the summation of all of our factor payments. And I'll abbreviate or I'll, I guess, expand upon what we mean by factor payments. By factor payments, what we mean is payments made to workers. So that is our wages. This is also payments made on borrowing. So this would be our interest. This is also payments um, paid out as profit. So to our firm, to our firms, to our businesses, to our uh, shareholders, this is the profit being paid out to the owners. And finally, this is factor payments being made out to our factor of production or capital. And that is the rent for renting that capital, for utilizing that capital. So four, four, four forces, four sources, of factor payments being the wages, what we pay out to our workers, our interest income, our profits, and our rent. So different sources of income there. What we also incorporate in this case here is our indirect taxes. Indirect taxes. And in this case here, this is our value added taxes. And really what we'd wanna say is indirect taxes less subsidies. So these would be the amounts coming back to us, subsidizing our purchases. And we'd want to include these on the income side. We'd want to add these, right? We'd want to add taxes to our income side. And there's two ways to think about this. This is income being collected by the government is one way to think about it. But more realistically, is this is being subtracted off of our expenditure side. Right, it's part of our expenditure side. So when we calculate all of our expenditure on consumption, hey, if I'm spending $100 on consumption, part of that is my indirect taxes. So that their firm, when they paid out our wages, interest, profit, and rent, well, they only paid this out based off of their after-tax income. 
So we need to include this indirect taxes in order to get the income and the expenditure side to equal. So factor payments plus indirect taxes. And then we'd want to include as well plus our depreciation. And we'd want to include plus depreciation because we want to include kind of our gross altogether. And you can kind of think about this. This is our payment for using up capital, right? When your employer uses you up, uses up your time, you get paid a wage. When we use capital, that capital similarly depreciates. It's, its time is used up. And so we need to add in kind of that payment for the depreciation of capital. So in this case here, if we add up these three sources, our factor payments, our indirect taxes, minus our subsidies, and our depreciation, these three sources together are the GDP. So if we want to take a look at that, if we go back to that circular flow diagram, we can see all of these. We have our wages, profit, rent, and interest coming from the firm through our factor markets to our households. We have our indirect taxes, that is our value added taxes, less our subsidies flowing through to the government. And we have our depreciation flowing through to our goods and services market. So as we measure all of our income on this side here, that's everything really coming out of the firm, we get our income side of GDP. One of the ways we can calculate this. Let's go take a look at the other one, the expenditure side of GDP. And to be honest, this expenditure side of GDP, this will be the focus of our semester. This will be the one that we're really going to spend a lot of time working through. If you really want to focus on one of these and just kind of minimally spend time on the others, focus on this guy. GDP expenditure is our big one. And GDP expenditure, it is made up uh, from all of our consumption. And keep in mind, we're taking a look, we're measuring GDP, so all final new goods and services produced in a year. So for consumption, this is consumption of all final new goods and services. So that is if you go to a thrift store and buy a used shirt, that's not consumption, right? Consumption is only on new goods and services. If you buy something off of Kijiji, that's not consumption. That's not a new good or service. Consumption would be going to Walmart and buying a t-shirt. Consumption would be going to Ford and buying yourself a new truck for personal use. These would be the kind of things that consumption is. If we take a look at it, consumption is the largest contributor to our expenditure side of GDP. And it accounts for about, here in Canada, about 56% of our total GDP. So just over half of our, of our country's GDP comes through consumption. And this is, this is relatively stable. In some countries, you will see this as high as 66% or as high as 70%. But in Canada, over the last few years at least, we've been hovering around 56. Not a lot of movement throughout the year or year to year in this. So a fairly stable measurement there. Our next measurement as we work through our GDP expenditure would be investment. And again, to be clear, investment is not what you do when you go and buy stocks or bonds or mutual funds. That's not investment, that is savings. Investment is when a firm, when a business goes and buys new productive capital. That is new equipment, tools, factories, vehicles for the increasing productive capabilities for them. That is what we mean by investment. So in this case here, this investment is kind of broken up into a few different categories. We could take a look at it as capital goods. So that is, like I said, our tools, our equipment, our factory, our machines. This is also going to be real estate. Real estate. So this is as the developer is developing the land, as the developer creates the housing stock. This is all an investment in capital. That is, new housing is investment. You don't consume a house. It is the developer 
that has invested in the real estate. So real estate falls into investment. And that's that's something that a lot of people get confused about, right? They go, oh, okay, I bought a new house. That purchase of the new house falls under consumption. No, 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 no. When that house was created, that was investment in real estate. It was counted there. Your purchase of that house, that's not part of GDP, right? That there's no longer a new thing. It was already counted as investment. It's not counted when you purchase it. So real estate is investment. We also have finally inventories. Inventories are goods produced that firms have been unable to sell by the end of period. So that is goods produced for consumption, but they were not yet sold. So in that case there, we would say that the firm had invested in their inventories and thus we have a stock of inventory available for sale in the next period. So inventories can be negative. If we have a lot of consumption, it could draw our inventories down. Inventories can also be positive if we are building up our stock of goods on the shelves, so to say. Investment itself, well, investment itself is depending, we can say it's about 15 to 20% depending on the year of GDP. While consumption is relatively stable year to year, investment is the most volatile. It is the most volatile. It will fluctuate a lot, up to 20% or even more, or it could drop off altogether even lower than 15%. That 15 to 20 is just kind of our typical zone of it. So it, it'll, it'll move around quite a bit. Carrying on, what we'd have, we have consumption, we have investment. We would also want to be taking a look at, I'll abbreviate that, government purchases. And this is government purchases, and government can make purchases for a few different reasons. They can purchase goods and services for consumption. So you can almost think of this as government consumption and that is hey the government goes and they hire a whole bunch of primary school teachers they're hiring their services to go and teach primary school well they're consuming that in that process there uh, government goes and buys a whole bunch of new um, vaccines right all these new vaccines being bought that is all consumption value they are being bought to be utilized at the same time right and when they're utilized they're now gone they've been consumed government can also engage in government investment and government investment and that is essentially the government building up either capital goods, real estate, or inventories. Not so much inventories. Government doesn't really build up inventories to sell to people later. Um, there are some public corporations out there that do have inventories, but that's, that's a fairly minute part. Ultimately, what we'd be looking at is the government purchase of capital goods. So, hey, the, decide, uh, the decision to build a new school, right? The decision to build a new hospital, or the acquisition of real estate and the development of that as well. So government purchases is them actually buying something. That really is a big part there. It's actually the government buying something. Let's say we take a look at a situation that we've recently had here in Canada, which is the CERB payment. Right? This CERB payment during the recent pandemic, this has been the government paying out money to every Canadian, well not every Canadian, but Canadians who have been affected by the pandemic. And this is money from the government just going out to people because they're citizens of Canada. Keep in mind in this case here, and maybe another one that we could kind of think of in this case would be employment insurance, same kind of idea. The government is just giving you money. They're not paying you to do a service. You're not doing anything for that money. It's not like you need to go sweep streets in order to receive it. You don't need to do anything. The government is just giving it to you as almost this negative tax. In that way there, 
these CERB payments, these employment insurance payments, any of these flows from the government to you, that is not government spending. That is not government purchases. These are what we would call transfer payments. And really what you can think of as this transfer payment is you can think of it as a negative tax. It is instead of you giving the government money in taxes, the government giving you money in a subsidy. So it's just this negative tax going on in this case, not a government purchase, not government spending. That's, that's a big distinction to be made. Okay, our final one there. Our final one is our trade balance, what we could be taking a look at. So let's write that down. Let's write trade balance. What our trade balance is, is our exports minus our imports. So our exports, everything that we sell out to the world, so everything we've produced domestically, all new goods and services produced domestically, which we've then sold to other countries, versus imports being all new goods and services that we have purchased from other countries. So our trade balance, also you'll see this instead of being written as trade balance, you'll see this being written as net exports. So net exports or our trade balance, two different synonyms going on there. Oh, we didn't really go through our typical percentage of total GDP. So let's go back up to government purchases and kind of take a look at that. In Canada, this typical percentage of GDP, that is the amount being spent on goods, services, and investment, is typically up to 30%. And that is up to. That is kind of a high end of that. Um, it can be lower. Sometimes maybe it can be a little bit higher, but 30%, that's, that's really getting at a high end of government spending, government purchasing within our market on whole. What about our trade balances? That is, what about our net exports? Typically speaking, this guy here in Canada hovers pretty close to 0%. I was like, what? How is that pretty close to 0%? Well, it's quite interesting, actually. Although exports and imports together are extremely large, when we actually difference the two, we get fairly close to zero year after year. That is, we have fairly balanced trade here in Canada. Um, some years we run a trade surplus, that is where we export more than we import. And in that case there, this would be slightly positive, maybe 1%. In other years, we run a trade deficit. We buy more stuff from the world than we sell, in which case this would be slightly negative. Um, we tend to, as people, have kind of a reluctance. We kind of hesitate. We're like, ooh, a negative. That's bad. A deficit. That's bad. Um, as we move through this course, hopefully we can kind of dispel that. We can go through this and say, hey, having a trade deficit isn't necessarily a bad thing. Having negative values for our net exports, that is this making up a negative part of our GDP, maybe that's not actually a bad thing either. So... In this, what we've seen is we've looked at two different ways to measure GDP. We've taken a look at how we can measure it through our income perspective, adding up all of our factor payments, indirect taxes, and depreciation. What we can also do is we can measure it through our expenditure, and that is by adding up our consumption, our investment, our government purchases, and our net exports. To be clear, this isn't often thrown in. It's typically assumed because we're talking about gross domestic product. When we're talking about investment, this is actually technically gross investment as well. That is net investment plus depreciation. So that is all the money we spend on capital goods and services. That's including the amount we have spent on depreciated, depreciated capital. So. When we're talking about our expenditure side, that is what we're really getting at there. Okay, that does us for this video. Again, what were our big goals here? Our big goals were to understand our circular flow diagram, to understand how money flows around here, 
Outside of that, the next big one was to have this understanding as to really what GDP is, that it is trying to measure that total value of all final goods and services produced within a year. We've looked at a bunch of different ways that we could measure it, value added, by the income approach, by the expenditure approach. The two big ones, and then the big one, are GDP through our income approach and GDP through our expenditure approach. One big learning outcome of this course is to be able to differentiate between those two. And then the big one, of course, is as we move on through the course, calculating GDP through our expenditure approach. This will be one that we'll, we will be looking at again and again and again ad nauseum. Okay, if you have any questions about anything we've covered in this video, please feel free to reach out to me. You can comment below, you can leave a post on the Frequently Asked Questions on D2L, and of course, you can feel free to email me. Thanks, until next time.